Hey, it's Mike Brennan. We're back for another MI Tech TV, and today is February 26. I still can't believe it's 2024. It's, it's like, really? Where'd the years go, right? But anyway, that'll be part of our program today. We're bringing in Michelle Krebs from Cox Automotive, and she's retiring. And uh, so uh, she's been covering autos longer than I've been covering technology. So she started in 1980. So part of what we'll do towards the end of the interview is talk a little bit about how everything has changed and, and we can speculate on where it might be headed. But let's start off with, uh, you know, Cox Automotive, uh, Auto Trader. What's, uh, what's really selling right now? What's not selling right now? I mean, what are you guys seeing? Well, it's kind of hard to tell. January is the only month we have sales for, and January is the lowest month of the year. February mm -hmm. isn't much better. Uh, so we're not really getting a sense yet of what the year is going to look like. Um, we we are forecasting that this year will be a little bit better than last year. Last year, we sold 15.5 million vehicles. This year, we expect 15.7. There could be some upside. We are always conservative. Um, so right now, um, it's a it's a mix, and it completely depends on inventory. Uh, while inventory has really improved from a year ago, uh, we're back to very substantial inventory industry wide, but it varies all over the map. I think the one big thing that's that is selling is hybrids. Um, Toyota had almost a third of its sales, I think, in January that were hybrids. And they're, of course, the leader. Um, the other story that we that is in the news is electric vehicles. And there seems to be this idea that their sales are just crashing. Well, they're not. Um, sales are increasing. We had a record year last year. We'll have a record year this year. But the thing is, they're not, everybody's producing EVs and there's just not a demand, enough demand to sop up all of the inventory that's out there and all the production that's come online. So, you know, um, it's still a, a a segment that's growing. In fact, it's growing more than, you know, any segment I've ever experienced. It was like 40 and 50 percent in the last few years. So um, well, but it's just not keeping up with all the production that's out there. Growing. The problem is that they were expecting like a rocket ship takeoff and they're not quite getting the rocket ship takeoff. Right. 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 And, you know, there have been some issues. You know, part of it is the price of them, the, although the average price of an EV is coming down closer. It's it's within a couple thousand dollars now of regular vehicles, but there's not a lot. On, I mean, I don't think there's anything under thirty thousand um, dollars. And you know, the EV infrastructure is just not there yet. And what of the of the charging stations that are out there? One of the big problems is maintenance. They're just not being maintained. So there's a lot of disappointment about that. So um, we got a. You know, we we will move into an EV future. It I think it'll be stretched out farther than people think. And in fact, the Biden administration is reportedly is considering easing some of the um, emissions uh, standards so that you know there's a slower rollout of EVs, um, which seems appropriate. Um, that is the future. It's just it's not going to be linear. It's not going to take off like crazy. Uh, for one, we aren't all in the car market at the same time. You know, I don't have an EV. I'm not in the car market right now. So, um, you know, we've got to wait. to. And then the middle of the market is a little more cautious than the early buyers of EVs. The early buyers were very affluent, most almost all in California. Um, and, you know, they bought Teslas like crazy. So now there's a lot more choice. There also needs to be a lot more education of consumers. What we find is they're just, when you get to the heart of the market where you're not, you know, way out in front, early uh, tech adopters, um, people need a lot more education. They're, they shop like six to eight times longer than uh, regular shop the shoppers of gasoline powered vehicles. And we're asking people to change their behavior. So that's a pretty radical change. Speaking of Tesla, uh, they've cut their prices significantly, and that's forced everybody else to make similar moves, right? That's correct. Um, Tesla has, they started to see that their inventory was building, that sales were slowing, and so they uh, cut prices several times last year. They, they jump all over the place, and that's true in China, that's true in 
um, Europe as well. And uh, we, we're, we've, we've even seen uh, Tesla have some incentives, um, and but they're the leader of the market. They dominate, you know, 50 percent, 50 to 60 percent of the market. So everybody follows Tesla. So last week we saw Ford cut the price of the Mustang Mach-E. Um, and we've seen some other companies uh, cut prices. The other thing that's not so much in the U.S. that's playing a role elsewhere in the world are the Chinese. Chinese are very good at EVs and they are in Europe and China, of course, um, and they have been really cutting prices. In fact, I think BYD introduced what's being called the Corolla killer, an EV that costs about $11,000 in China. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah. So, uh, and, and, and the stuff is pretty good. So um, we don't have them here because we block that, but you know, th that day is going to come. I was going to ask you actually what what is the lowest price EV available currently in the United States and what is its range? Uh well I think the Chevy Bolt was but of course that's gone out of production that was around 30,000. I think the Nissan Leaf is still in that lower ballpark. I don't have all the ranges and prices in my head. Um but um you know the the average price is about $50,000. So Okay. And the average price of all vehicles is forty eight thousand. So, um, and, and there are more higher. that are coming into the thirty thousands. Uh, GM introduced the the Blazer. Of course, that's not on sale right now. They have a stop sale on it uh, for quality issues, but um, that was somewhere in the thirty thousands, I think. Gotcha. Okay. So, also uh, hybrids. Uh... Uh, we had Paul Eisenstein on a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about hybrids and he viewed them as a sort of stepping stone to mm -hmm. EVs because all the reasons you just pointed out that the infrastructure is not really in place. The electric vehicles are very expensive. People are a little, you know, leery about spending that kind of dough on something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, EVs give you the, the, the safety cushion of having an ice engine there in case uh, you're driving along to grandma's house and suddenly your battery poops out on you. Uh, so in Toyota, of course, uh, they were kind of, everybody was chiding them a year or two ago for not getting into EVs fast enough. Right. And maybe they were the smart one, right? So they saw this and and they've had a number of hybrids out for a long time. And I, I, uh, I've i driven a few hybrids. It's it, They're interesting. I'm still an old kind of gearhead guy. So I'll be one of the last ones to buy an electric vehicle, but uh, but you see a lot of the other automakers maybe thinking rethinking the hybrid thing. And for instance, GM, what was it by twenty thirty five? It's going to be all electric. Mm -hmm. Well, that kind of went by the wayside, and now they have backed off that. So what do you see? How do you see that playing out? Well, you know, Toyota has been the lead in, in hybrids, um, and Honda's right there too. Uh, um, also, you know, you can't ignore the Koreans, the the, the South Koreans, uh, Hyundai and Kia do the whole range. They do gas, they do electric, they do hybrids, uh, they do plug-in hybrids. So they have always, and those companies have always seen hybrid as, hybrids as the stepping stone to EVs. Um, they don't require that much of a change in your lifestyle. So, and does does give you the comfort of the range. The other thing is some of the hybrids are a lot less expensive. You know, Toyota's got some that I think are under 30,000. They've got Corolla hybrids and, um, you know, the RAV4 hybrid. RAV4 is the best selling one. Um, so, but we are seeing, and, and Ford's had, you know, hybrids in the mix too. They've had a, the Ford hybrid F-150 and, they just dropped the F1, the hybrid uh, Explorer, but for the next generation, um, but they've got some hybrids. But GM was the one that was all electric. And um, now they've had to backpedal that a little bit. I don't quite know how they're going to institute uh, hybrid technology here in the US. They said it, this year they're all electric, but um, they're going to bring in hybrids using technology that they have in, uh, in China. I, it's just, you don't just snap your fingers and, you know, put up a plant and add production to a plant or whatever with hybrids. I don't know how that's all going to work out. Um, 
What what do you think of the American automakers' attitude towards hybrids? I know, you know, a couple of the American marks have said, "Boy, God, we're all in on EVs, and EVs is it, and you know, we're not going to monkey around with hybrids." Do you think that's changing? Yeah, I mean, GMs the that was the holdout. Uh, they're the ones that said we were all electric. You know, Stellantis has always had the hybrid. Uh, they have the hybrid um, Pacifica minivan. They've had that for quite a while, plug-in hybrid. Um, then they have the um, Jeep 4XE uh, that's also a plug-in hybrid. So they're there, although Stellantis is being pretty aggressive on EVs. Um, they they are full steam ahead. And and then Ford's always said it's had a mix. What, what, what has happened, though, is sometimes the automakers will downplay that they're doing hybrids to, for Wall Street. Wall Street for a, a couple of years ago was like, oh, you got to be all in on EVs and um, mm. turned out now they're saying, oh, you got to have hybrids. So, um, <laughs> you know, we are seeing a little bit of shifting, not only in the strategy, but also, you know, just how they talk about it. The other thing that is springing up, and it was just a story that I published in my publication over the weekend that I saw, uh, that uh, China is talking about setting up plants in Mexico. And that's got a lot of people in the auto industry in the U.S. pretty rattled because then they'll be using low-cost Mexican labor and then the Chinese know-how for hybrids and EVs. And as you said, you know, some of their vehicles are like eleven, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. Now, of course, coming into the U.S. market, they'd probably all sorts of safety things they have to do and it would raise the price. But still, if it's below $20,000, Wow, huh? You know, is that yes. a big threat to the auto, the U.S. auto oh, industry? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the Chinese would have a more difficult. They want to be in the U.S. market. Um, you know, the politics don't work in their favor right now. But so, uh, bringing them in directly from China would be a problem, and certainly they wouldn't. You know, there's already hassles about them building. Um, a, uh, battery plants here or using, you know, Ford using uh, Chinese technology. So the way I see that they'll get around that is they'll build plants in Mexico, BYD, which is the biggest EV maker in the world, bigger than Tesla, um, is has, is searching around for a location and searching for asking for government incentives to build a plant in Mexico. And there's already um, some Chinese suppliers there. There's Chinese suppliers coming in to support Tesla, which is in, has its plant in Texas, and then it's uh, it's going to build a plant in Mexico. So it's and you know if you're uh, if you you can they can bring them into the U.S. that way under the uh, USMCA trade agreement. So and then they could. It is very possible that if they designed them just right, they could also uh, get the uh, in, the EV tax credit under the Inflation Reduction Act. Huh. So yeah, it's a, a big threat, and there's a lot of alarm bells going off right now. So leaving EVs for a minute, a uh, huge story in the free press on Sunday about. Ford uh, Takata airbag recalls not being performed properly. Um, are you hearing the anything gift about that? The gift that keeps that? on giving. The gift yeah. that keeps on giving. You know, yeah. we, the, the biggest recall in the world was the Takata airbag uh, uh, recall a few years ago. And a lot of the vehicles have had to um, be recalled again. You know, Ford's not alone in that. It just happened that three press did that story, um, you know, other automakers, Honda, I know has gone back out and tried to get, these are old vehicles. A lot of times they're, you yeah. know, 20, 25 years uh, old. And so tracking down, it's hard enough getting the first owner to bring a recalled vehicle in, but you know, the second and third owners, uh, it's been a real challenge on that. So, um, so I guess Ford is, I don't know the details of it, but making a big effort to, get some of those back and some of the recalls that were done were not were not uh successful and that's it's not just a ford thing it's anybody who used takata airbags and everybody did so yeah the, the, the if i remember right from that article it was something like more than 60 million of them it's I something mean, like that yes that's a staggering number yes yes but it's every once in a while you'll see an automaker recall again some of its vehicles that uh, had had a recall fixed 
sometimes even the second time and uh, they're called back in. So hmm. yeah, that's been, I call it the gift that keeps on giving because it comes up frequently. Yeah, absolutely. And probably will continue to for a while. So can we speak to what's selling in the used car market? Do you have some data on that? What's hot right now? Uh, I don't know exactly what's hot in the used car market. I don't follow that as closely, but I will say that we we typically see the used car market really heat up when people start getting their tax refunds. Um, their little tax refunds are a little slower to come out this year, but um, people use their tax refunds to buy used vehicles. So we see a big spike in um, sales and we see, a, uh, that's when we see the higher prices too. So that, that'll, um, that'll taper off maybe in May, but it's like February to May, that's when we see all those refunds being used for that. So. Well, and of course, the GM profit sharing check was what twelve five this year, and I, I didn't see what Ford got, but I imagine it's something somewhat similar. So ten eleven, I thought, yeah, yeah, it'd be a nice downstroke on a car, twelve thousand mm -hmm. dollars, right? Especially mm -hmm. a used car, right? I'd probably pay for half of it, you know. So yeah, yeah, I think the average used car right now is listing at around twenty eight thousand dollars, something like that, and that's come down a little bit, but um, you know, there's still kind of a shortage of really good late model uh, used cars because when you don't sell a lot of new cars you're not uh creating uh the used cars and also we have had a really low level of leasing uh and especially because interest rates are high it just doesn't make the leasing formula work very well so we don't have those cars being turned back in to be sold as um used vehicles so it's just a, you know a lot of demand in the used car market especially as people um, you maybe can't afford a new car. A lot more people are moving to the used car market, but um, the inventory of, you know, fresher uh, used vehicles is pretty tight and will be for a couple of years. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we wanted you to talk a little bit about, you know, what you view as the uh, the, the major changes in the uh, in the auto industry and the uh, the the years that you've been covering it, what would you say? I'm not going to ask you to pick just one thing, but maybe the top three. Well, I think, you know, um, computerization changed everything in the automotive industry. You know, we went from carburetors to fuel injectors and, you know, using uh, engine management control systems and that kind of thing. That, that's been absolutely huge. Um, my first, my early cars had carburetors. And uh, so um, I think that's been a huge thing. And then, you know, the, the internet, when I started covering the auto industry, there was no internet. Um, and that's changed a lot of things in terms of, I mean, we have Kelly Blue Book and Auto Trader. You go shopping on those. Uh, they didn't exist before the internet, um, or at least they were magazine form, not in uh, online so much. So that has had a, a huge change. And that means changes in the way uh, automakers advertise uh, and promote. But there is no bigger change in the auto industry than the electrification. Um, that will be the biggest change in the auto industry, probably since we went from horse and buggy to um, cars. It's just a massive change because it requires massive change in suppliers, massive change in our our behavior, how we how we use cars, um, how we fuel them. It's you know it's expands to the grid and the whole infrastructure. So I'll sit by the sidelines and watch how it all plays out. But it it is it will be the biggest change, and it's going to be rocky. And there will be winners, and there will be losers. Hmm. Yeah, and I'm not going to say who I think will be it, but be those because I just it, it it will be hard to know. Yeah, and so uh, what do you think is what companies do you think in in your scope of your career starting in 1980 have been the most innovative? Uh, uh, it doesn't have to be an American company, but I mean, who are the real innovators out there? Obviously Tesla, but that's a recent development. I'm mm -hmm. thinking over a long term. Is it GM, Ford, Toyota? Who's been the most innovative, would you say? Oh, that's that's a hard question because they've been in a, in a different way. Certainly, I mean, Tesla changed everything because, you know, we wouldn't be on the electrification path if it weren't for uh, Tesla. You know, there's uh, I, I don't know that I could answer that with one single company because they've all had some innovations. Um, 
Of course, then we thought we had a lot of innovation in diesel engines. It turns out that wasn't real. So, uh, you know, the VW diesel gate story was a huge story. And, um, uh, you know, it, it just went for plop. 